The BBC's morality is not my, my morality. The BBC's morality is a media morality, which has groomed the nation, in my view, to accept things which it ought not to accept. Coming up on British Thought Leaders journalist and author Robin Aitken. After 25 years at the BBC, Robin says Britain's national broadcaster needs to be reformed or defunded. I am coming to the view that unless there is real reform of the BBC within the next couple of years, it's time to, to say sayonara because um, you cannot have, uh, the dishonesty in the organisation is this, that, that it proclaims itself to be impartial and honest, but it's not impartial, and that's the worst of both worlds. Robin shares why it's important for our society to talk about the divine. This idea that we have somehow, that we can do without this idea of God, that we can do without God, other societies have tried it, uh, communist Russia tried it, Nazi Germany tried it, lots of other societies have tried it, and it ends always in human misery. Welcome to British Thought Leaders, I'm Lee Hall. Today I'm sitting down with Robin Aitken, journalist and author. Robin, thanks for joining us. Pleasure. So you've been a journalist over 40 years. You were 25 years at the BBC, including on the flagship news show, the Today programme. Uh, the BBC says it's independent, impartial and honest. I mean, what are your thoughts on that? I'd say it was independent. I'm not so sure about the other two. Um, you know, when I joined the BBC, which was back in the 1970s, I was a young journalist. I'd worked in newspapers. And uh, it was my ambition to work for the BBC because... I had carried with me from my youth the idea that the BBC was the best broadcaster in the world. And um, so I joined with very high hopes, and I liked my work. Um, I worked my way up in a very sort of BBC way. I started in a reporter role on a local station. Then I went national. I worked in Scotland. Um, I did a bit of foreign work. I ended up, as you say, on the flagship radio program, The Morning Show the, Today. By that stage, it had become clear to me that the BBC is not impartial in the way that it thinks it is. So many of the things which were of concern to me, issues which I thought were very important, were either not dealt with at all by the BBC, or if they were, they were approached from the other end of the argument. So I'm thinking of, in terms of um, things, um, I suppose one would say, I consider myself to be a social conservative, if you get, you know, if you, if you understand the term, in that I feel that, um, that the moral basis of society is the most important aspect of how society functions and thrives. The BBC's morality is not my, my morality. The BBC's morality is a media morality, which has groomed the nation, in my view, to accept things which it ought not to accept. So I came to understand, actually, that the BBC was actually um, a very ideological organisation with its own worldview and a very um, coercive internal culture. I started agitating inside the BBC while I was still working there, and I wrote to my senior bosses, and eventually right the way up to the people who supposedly run the organization, who back in those days were the board of governors. I wrote to them um, with a dossier of specific instances where I thought it was clear the BBC had been unfair and biased in its coverage of certain topics. And they gave me the brush off. So this was back in the noughties. I got no change out of it at all. I thought, right, well, actually, um, I can't go on working for this organization because it's not honest. And I, feel, I felt hypocritical working for it. Um, the BBC <laughs> were quite keen to get rid of me by this point <laughs> because um, I had been causing as much internal trouble as I could. I never went public. I thought that would have been a dishonorable thing to do. because I was Were there others on your side, then? Very few, but there were a couple. There were a couple. 
good men and true who saw things the way I saw them. Um, so I was writing all these internal memos. I was, I was uh, demanding meetings and explanations from the organization. Uh, not unnaturally, they got fed up with this. Um, and in typical BBC fashion, they offered me a generous redundancy deal. So I thought, well, yeah, why not, actually? So I took the money and wrote a book. Um, since then, I've written several other books. Um, another book about the BBC, which came out um, just a few years ago, called The Noble Liar, which is a much more mature book, actually, than my first book, which was called um, Can We Trust the BBC? Which was very much, that first book I wrote was very much the story of one reporter's journey through the BBC. It was very, it was from a very personal point of view, really. Um, the second book was a more, was a, a wider ranging book, I think uh, uh, has a much better perspective. And um, so here I am. Can you give us some examples of some of the, the news stories that show the BBC failing in its mission? Certainly. I mean, it's, um, you hear them, you see them every day when you turn on a bulletin. Let me give you a current example, something which is causing a lot of concern here and also in, in America. Um, this so-called crisis of mental health amongst young people. Now, I don't doubt that there are a lot of unhappy young people in the country. The question is, seeking the causes for that is one of the purposes of journalism. So if you look at journalism in the round, in a democracy, um, journalists should be the canaries in the cage. They should spot, analyze, and investigate problems. So we have this problem of a lot of young people in Britain who are uh, unhappy and mentally unwell, it is said. What is the cause for that? What is the reason behind that? Um, I think it's closely linked to the breakdown in family life. I think that, that unstable families lead to unhappy children. If you look at the BBC's coverage of that story, it's all about the lack of resources for mental health clinics. It's about, they like to pin the blame, blame on social media. I don't say social media is blameless, but I don't think it's the main cause. So in my view on that particular story, the real core issue is about family breakdown, family stability. Why doesn't the BBC investigate that story from that angle? I'll tell you why. Because we have lived through an age of hyper-liberalism. Um, I mean, liberalism has many definitions, but I think its broadest definition would be that it is a philosophy which seeks human freedom um, in every aspect. And we have lived through an age, I have, I'm in my 70s now, and in my lifetime, Britain has adopted a hyper liberal attitude to, um, to, to society and individual behavior. That has led to the situation where more than a million children in the country don't have a father. Um, rates of divorce and family breakdown are sky high. Uh, a lot of people don't bother getting married and uh, unmarried relationships sadly tend to be uh, less stable and less long lasting than married married relationships. So those are the, in my, in my view, that is the reason we have so many unhappy young people. Yeah. And the BBC never joins the dots. It prefers to um, portray that as the consequence of some other factors. The reason it doesn't do that, the reason it doesn't follow my line of thinking, is because to do so, would challenge one of the precepts of liberalism. You know, the, the, the very liberal divorce laws we now have in Britain, where you can get divorced at the drop of a hat yeah. without giving any reason at all. Um, that is something which, in my view, a healthy society would reverse. Um, but there are things, that is one story which concerns me and I've tried to explain why I think the BBC 
distorts that story. There are many, many others. I mean, the, the, this conflict that's going on in, in Israel at the moment and in, in Gaza, um, there's been a lot of comment about this, about the fact that the BBC initially wouldn't call Hamas a, a, a terrorist organization. And the idea that in some way um, liberal, uh, that Israel is in some way responsible for this thing. Um, that very much accords with the BBC's worldview. The BBC always takes um, the, the, the side of that party, which can be portrayed as victims. Right. And so um, you'll see this repeated over and over again. This often puts the BBC in a position where it is on the side of, metaphorically speaking, groups which are very much opposed to a Western way of life, opposed to us. And if they had their way, they'd do away with us. So um, I think the, the crassest example in recent years of the BBC's bias was um, the Black Lives Matter um, episode where the BBC um, took the knee enthusiastically and tried to actually and successfully propagandized the country um, from the perspective of Black Lives Matter, never um, bothering to investigate its antecedents and real motives. It's a Marxist organization. It was on the website. Yeah. And it's a Marxist organization which, which has subsequently proved to be deeply corrupt. And yet um, we were supposed to swallow whole this, this tale and to import into Britain, which I think is so wrong, um, a, uh, a discourse about race relations which is pertinent in America but not here. Race relations, luckily, actually are much better here than they are in most countries, at least in my experience. So that was another example where the BBC um, threw itself wholeheartedly into the promotion of this particular story. And once again, I think that that just betrays the underlying ideology which drives the BBC. The BBC talks a lot about diversity when it comes to its workforce. I mean, you worked there a long time. Does that diversity stretch to political opinion? <laughs> No, and when, I, and when I'm asked this question, I always say that when the, when the word diversity comes up in BBC meetings, what they get out the skin colour chart, you know? How many have we got of black and brown and white and Asiatics, you know? It's, if you, so if you, if you tick the right boxes on the, on the uh, skin colour chart, then you're fulfilling your diversity quotas. Similarly with... Um, with, with sexual orientation and um, those kind of issues, which are, it's a, what it what it means actually is that um, what you get is um, a workforce which is quite diverse in terms of racial background, but not at all diverse in terms of its political outlook, and it's. Um, you know, real diversity, um, which is what the BBC should be aiming for, um, is nowhere on the horizon in the BBC. There's a point about um, the importance of this subject. You know, we don't bang on about diversity of opinion when it comes to other media organisations. So... You know, you could say, well, the Daily Telegraph, for which I write often. Daily Telegraph is, is an unabashedly right-wing newspaper. It takes a conservative line. But it's entitled to do so, and all its money comes from people who buy the newspaper and therefore are self-selecting. When it comes to the BBC, we all pay for the BBC. And the quid pro quo of the universal license fee and the fact that we all have to pay, the quid pro quo is that every opinion should be represented on the BBC fairly, and that's what doesn't happen. You very rarely hear, I mean, during the Brexit debate, it became laughable. The, <laughs> the, BBC's, the BBC's evident 
partisanship on that issue was striking and became obvious to people. And I think actually the Brexit episode, the whole thing, the whole saga, um, was uh, something which brought into focus for a lot of people just what's wrong with the BBC. As the national broadcaster, we can kind of expect the BBC to represent the views of the people or to, to some degree reflect them. But you say that they're not really doing that at all. Well, um, of course, they, they reflect some views of some of the people very well indeed. Um, Newsnight, which was the, you know, the, the so-called flagship news programme on BBC Two every evening for the past 43 years, I think it is. If you looked at that program and you looked at its output, um, it was basically the Guardian on wheels, basically. You know. it, it, um, the things it chose to investigate were things of concern to liberal, left-wing, metropolitan-type people. And it did a very good job of representing them. But if you take the things which concern, say, a working-class community, in the North Midlands, let's say, um, who are, have been inundated with a lot of, of um, migrant workers. Look, I'm not against immigration. Uh, I think healthy societies have immigration, and it's unhealthy if you don't. But like a digestive system, um, a country can only be expected to absorb so many immigrants at a time. And the people who suffer when mass immigration gets out of hand are people in less well-skilled jobs, less well-paid jobs, the working classes in other words. And they feel rightly disgruntled when they see people coming in, newly arrived, uh, undercutting their wages and often being housed at public expense. You know, that's not fair, and it actually upsets the apple cart. It, it doesn't breed harmonious uh, community relations. And why doesn't the BBC represent those views? Because it finds them distasteful. Uh, why does it find them distasteful? Because the BBC is staffed almost in its entirety by well-educated, middle-class, younger people. And these are the very people who have been through a university system which has taught them to believe in certain rights and wrongs. Um, a lot of them are very naive. They're very callow, a lot of young BBC journalists. You know, just you can tell from the way I speak, probably, that I, I, you know, I, I come from a certain background. I was educated in a particular way. I went to a boarding school. My pronunciation is, is what's known as received pronunciation. It's viewed now as very posh. It just happens to be the way I speak. But my first journalistic job was as a junior reporter on a country in the black, in the black country, on a newspaper in the black country, a weekly newspaper, um, an entirely working class community. It was a center of the metal casting industry. It was a dirty, dark, black, hard working town. That taught me an awful lot. And it taught me that the assumptions I have made about society as a young man in my 20s were not those universally <laughs> assumed by everybody else. Now, it would do BBC journalists a world of good to come down off the moral high ground and rub shoulders with people lower down the social scale and see a different, have a different take on reality. But, you know, you talk about diversity. How many working class people are there in the BBC in programme making roles? Very few. And those who are tend to be absorbed into the, the great media class mm. and very quickly become media class and lose their, their sort of working class perspective. So this big um, disconnect between the BBC and the British public, has that come about because like, some kind of management group thing, would you say? Yeah, I mean, I think groupthink is a very apposite term um, because, let me give you an example. So um, 
When I worked at the Today program, and incidentally I worked under a, an editor who I greatly admired and very much liked, Rod Liddell. Uh, he was the editor at the time, and I had a great time with him. Um, every morning on that program, when the program finishes, the program finishes at 9, about 10.30, 10.45, there'd be a morning meeting at which we'd discuss the following day's program. Now, one, uh, one year, this young female journalist had joined. Um, she was mixed race background, a bright woman um, in her 20s, I suppose. So if you're sitting around in the, in, the, um, in the green room talking about what we were going to do for the following day's program, everyone's supposed to chuck in ideas. I used to enjoy this immensely because it was a chance to, to uh, outrage opinion <laughs> on the program amongst all those good liberals by suggesting things which fell outside their own perspective, you know. And um, so we had this morning meeting and afterwards, this, I think maybe she was uh, allotted to me to help me out on a story I was doing. So we got talking and she said, she said, you know, um, she said, uh, I, I was afraid to say anything there this morning. She said, she said, in my family, we all read the Daily Mail. Right? But she said, I, I didn't really feel I could I could. That's the way. It, you know, the thing is that it's you. You have to have a. You have to have a bit of courage, to stand up and speak your mind when everybody around you, far more senior people, people whose names you probably know because they're stars of TV and radio, in the BBC it takes a lot, to step out of line and express a different opinion. So the, the group think actually is a very coercive thing and people feel a pressure to actually conform to the general view within the BBC which tends as I say to be a hyper liberal view. So you mentioned the license fee I mean, in the parlance of our times do you think it's time to defund the BBC? Well um, I have never been someone who has campaigned to destroy the BBC. I have always been one of those who has said that the ideal of a public service broadcasting company which is impartial, accurate, honest, truthful, decent, such a broadcaster would be of immense value, immense value to any democracy. So the ideal of the BBC is an excellent ideal and I have always argued for reform but the problem is that reform seems to be taking a, an awful long time and it's not apparent to me that there has been reform. So I think we're approaching the point at which I am coming to the view that unless there is real reform of the BBC within the next couple of years, it's time to... to say sayonara because um, you cannot have uh, the dishonesty in the organization is this that that it proclaims itself to be impartial and honest but it's not impartial and that's the worst of both worlds the telegraph the times um, the guardian these organizations don't need to proclaim that they're impartial because they don't have to be. They're entitled to their view. Let them have it. And let them be honest and open about it. You know, The Guardian's a left-wing newspaper, Telegraph's a right-wing newspaper. Fine. That's exactly right. People know what they're getting into. The danger comes when you've got an organization like the BBC which says, we have no side, we are impartial, and yet it does have a side, and it's not impartial. It's very partisan. And that's a danger. And part of the problem is that the BBC has this enormous and worldwide reputation and it's it is one of the best known brands in the world and in broadcasting terms i should think probably it's as it's as big a brand as there is in the whole world in terms of broadcasting and um so for it to be proclaiming itself as impartial whilst doing something which is clearly not impartial um is 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 defrauding people. 
it's fooling people into thinking this is an organization uh, which is something which it is not. So, um, very sadly, I'm coming around to the view that, that the BBC, the license fee, should be ended. Um, there's other reasons for that anyway. I mean, the fact is that, you know, when, when the BBC began, which was uh, 100 years ago last year, actually, so uh, in uh, 1922 the BBC started as an organisation. And in those days, uh, because of the limitations of the technology, the number of wavelengths available to broadcasters was very limited. And they were only able to, to, to broadcast on what was called long wave or medium wave, um, which, if you know anything about radio technology, these waves travel a long distance. Uh, they're, they're a long wavelength. So the European nations got together in Geneva, and there was a treaty which allocated uh, wavelengths to Germany, wavelengths to France, wavelengths to Britain. And uh, we only got one wavelength. So, so it was a monopoly service. And it was a monopoly service for which the license fee is a monopoly payment system. And that made perfect sense. If we only had one radio station in the country, which everyone had to listen to, everyone should pay for it. I've got no problem with that. It was absolutely right and obvious that that was so. Now, with the proliferation of broadcasting platforms, you know, the infinite number of stations that you can have, the, the, the logic of the license fee has been undermined. And there are lots of people, of course, Lee, you'll know this, that, that a lot of people who actually don't watch the BBC, don't use BBC services, and yet they're supposed to pay for it. And that doesn't seem right or equitable or logical even. So I think that for, for that reason, if for no other reason, the, the, the era of the license fee is coming to an end. It's already in sight. We're all awaiting as we speak. You know, we've been waiting actually for six months, or I have been, to hear what the government um, is going to pronounce on this subject. They have a, there's a review underway at the moment, um, uh, which has been looking at the BBC and its future method of funding. Um, so it'll be very interesting to see what they come up with. I'd love to get your opinion on the different regulatory schemes as well. So you mentioned the newspapers. Obviously, they can be left-wing, right-wing, whereas we've got Ofcom with the broadcasting and it's like everything has to be in balance. Yes. Do you think that's a good system? No, I don't. Um, and I have a beef with Ofcom, that Ofcom... Um, tradition has been mainly staffed by ex-BBC people. Now, I think there has been signs of change at, at Ofcom recently. I was very struck by a comment made by the chairman of Ofcom, Michael Grade. He said recently, he, he said, well, I, I'm not quoting him exactly, but he said words to the effect that what Ofcom wanted to see was a broadcasting landscape where there were lots of different voices from different viewpoints. And he was talking in the context of this news station, GB News. Now, GB News is brash, populist, um, but it undoubtedly has, has, um, has tuned in to a particular um, strand of opinion in the country which has not hitherto been properly represented. Now, um, Ofcom so far has been quite tolerant of GB News, um, despite calls from certain quarters for GB News to be closed down. It seems at the moment to be minded to let the organisation go its own way and find its feet, which is great. But I don't. I, I think that the. I think a civilized society, any society, has the right to determine what is right and proper for broadcast. So I think, for instance, that if a radio station was to arise in Britain which was clearly racist in intent, then I think the authorities would be right to say, no, you don't. You know, we're not having that. Yeah. 
we don't want that, so close them down. The great irony, of course, is that when it comes to something just as um, evil and destructive, in my view, something like pornography, the country and the government seem entirely uh, laid back about it, seem not to be bothered about the fact that people can see um, very damaging um, pornography at the, at the click of a button. And so on the one hand, you've got, an, you've got a government saying, we will monitor very carefully and the, the broadcasters and make sure that nothing bad is broadcast. At the same time, you've got unrestricted access to something which is, in my view, very damaging. Um, those two things, well, you might say, well, these are different things. Are they really? Is it really right that, that we should allow young people access to that kind of material? Why have we no will to, to censor pornography? I'm somebody who would, I think that censorship um, it has a dirty, has a, it's a dirty word in our society. But there are things that people should not be exposed to. Um, and I wish that we were a bit more militant about trying to combat pornography. I wanted to uh, take a step back and ask you about journalism more generally. You've been doing this 40-odd years. Uh, it seems journalism's under attack to some degree. We're seeing newsrooms losing funding. We're seeing AI take over some of the roles. Even the way people consume their news is somewhat changing. And compared to when you were a roving reporter, do you think the quality of our journalism now is up, up there? Um, there is some very good journalism still around. I think um, there is a problem with um, local journalism in this country now because um, local newspapers have lost so much ground. I mean, the, the newspapers that I worked for, first of all, disappeared, and that's the same story in so many towns uh, around the country. They no longer have a local newspaper, which is a great shame, I think. Um, I think that in some ways... The journalism we have today is at least in a in the sense of immediacy is better than it was. Um, not much can happen anywhere in the world these days without it being rapidly filmed. So that's you know, that's a real advance. Yeah. That is a real advance. You know, if 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 one you know, if you had a thought experiment, and suppose you go back to uh, 1930s Germany, um, and or actually 1940s Germany, when the persecution of the Jews began really to ramp up. Now, imagine that same circumstance today. Um, they wouldn't have been able to keep it quiet, mm. is what I'm saying. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. It would be online, you know. And even repressive um, regimes like China, um, the current Chinese regime, they haven't been able entirely to suppress news about what's happening to the Uyghurs in Xinjiang. And that's interesting. You know, it means that, in a way, uh, autocrats and authoritarian governments don't have the same control they used to have, and that must be a good thing. And you can see also that there are people, there are brave reporters out doing difficult jobs in war zones, and I take my hat off to them. Um, so in that sense, um, I think you know, journalism is still a vital force, and it's a very vigorous thing. And um, so, of course, it's, it's, changed, uh, it, it's changed in its formatting, I do regret the fact that I think that the newspapers of my, when I was middle-aged, the newspapers then were better staffed. I'm talking about national newspapers now. 
They were better staffed. There was more money. They were making money. And a lot of that money went into news gathering and, and news reporting. So I think um, that has dwindled somewhat, and it's, it's a shame. And I don't think that the foreign coverage, for instance, that you get in the Times or the Telegraph or the Guardian, um, it, it's not as in-depth and as good as it was. But on the other hand, <laughs> you know, there are, I, one of the things, I mean, I, I, I try to consume a very wide range of media because I think that uh, if you're in the business, but even if you're not in the business, if you're just a concerned citizen, mm -hmm. that if you want to understand what's happening in the world, consume as many different sources of news as you can from right across the spread, and then you'll begin to understand. You'll, you'll hear things here that you won't hear there. That's the way to become informed. So one of the news sites that I regularly use is Politico. Mm. Now, its politics are not my politics, necessarily, but they're Brussels Bureau. Um, their reporting on, on, on their Politico Europe site is an excellent site. Um, that wouldn't have been available to me 40 years ago. Or take France 24, the, the, the French English language rolling news service. That's another service I often use use because it gives you a French perspective on the world, which is also very interesting. Um, you know, I wouldn't have been able to get that 30 years ago. So these are advances, but, but there are losses too. And um, also there's the impermanence of, I spend quite a lot of time, or I have been spending quite a lot of time in newspaper archives recently because of something I'm trying to write. And um, the printed word you know, is I think that the, that some of the some of the broadcast medium it's so ephemeral it'll be lost, and there won't be a way of accessing it in the future. Whereas with newspapers, um, you know, you've got a hard record. Mm -hmm. So gains. Up, but finally, just to I mean, just to say that um, last week, a young man had contacted me and said. Uh, he, he'd, he'd done his degrees, he'd tried this and that, and he decided he wanted to be a journalist, right? So he came to see me. Smashing young bloke, in his early 20s, well-educated, open-minded, uh, recognized woke for what it was, uh, didn't dismiss it out of hand, but was skeptical about it, properly skeptical and curious about the world. And I thought, well, there's a, a young man, he seems to have all the right attributes to be a journalist. So there are still people who, you know, the great, the one great thing that should mark out journalists is their curiosity, intellectual curiosity about the world. Not taking things for, for granted and not just accepting the boilerplate conventional wisdom um, about things. That's the problem in the BBC. There are two, it's it's such a comfortable environment to work in as a journalist. It's very easy to lose sight of the fact that the world outside is very different from the world inside. You said you're a social conservative. I mean, do you think a lack of uh, a moral compass in our media and broadcasting is having an effect on society? Yes, a very bad effect. I mean, I, I, I said earlier in this interview that I thought we'd lived through an age of hyper-liberalism. Um, one of the aspects of that is that in this culture we now live, people are encouraged to find themselves, express themselves, be your best self. It's all about, it's all about the sovereign individual. The idea that you, I, all of us can construct our own moral universe from scratch. I don't believe that. As it happens, I'm a Catholic. I was brought up a Catholic, and I have tried in my life <laughs> to be a good Catholic. I, I, I'm sure I haven't been, actually. I've often failed. But um, the point about uh, the teachings of the Catholic Church one is that they are, they are a tradition of moral thought stretching back for more than 2,000 years. These are 
tried and tested precepts about how people should live a good life. And the, the golden rule, so-called, the idea that um, the two important commandments, love God and your neighbor as yourself. Okay, imagine for a moment, just imagine. Suppose everybody in the world loved their neighbor as themselves. We would have heaven on earth. So if everybody put the other guy first, if everyone was selfless and did everything they could for their brother man, well, we would have a wonderful world. Now, we're never going to get there on this earth. I know that uh, because we're all selfish, me no less than anybody else. But that teaching, the idea that it's not all about you, it's not all about me, it's about us, and it's about, it is about acknowledging our frailties and our weaknesses and working for the common good and doing so in a moral framework which is clear and um, unambiguous. So, for instance, this question of family breakdown, which I mentioned, I'm a great believer in, I think the family is, healthy families are the bedrock of a healthy society. Without healthy, thriving families, you won't have a healthy, thriving society. And this society now, in the past 50 years, has taken a nosedive in these terms. There are now so many um, fatherless families, broken homes. Um, now, I'm not saying and I am certainly not condemning anybody um, when I say this, but the ideal situation to raise children is in a stable family with a mother and a father, male and female. And I think that, that anybody who feels that we have um, stumbled on another answer in the last 50 years is kidding themselves. Actually, the, the uh, unstable families are um, perilous for children and lead to unhappiness and often, you know, um, uh, abuse and, and, and uh, very wicked things happen to children under those circumstances. Now, the, you know, traditional, conventional, orthodox Christian teaching says uh, you marry your wife or you marry your husband and you stick with them. And it's not easy, you know. Nobody says it's easy. And there will be difficulties and sometimes relationships break down. I get that absolutely. And that, you know, that there will never be a situation where everybody has a happy family life. I understand that. That's just the way it is. But what we should strive for and what we should encourage in society is a return to the idea that stable families are worth having and should be, and legislation should help that, you know. I mean, that, that is one aspect of, of, of moral teaching where I think we've gone badly astray. But the, the I was looking at some statistics, um, uh, crime statistics, and in the early 1950s when I was born, there was just short of a million recorded crimes in England and Wales. And <laughs> the figure today, <laughs> it is a multiple of that, and we know that many crimes aren't even recorded as crimes. This idea that, that somehow shoplifting has been decriminalized, it's mad. That is mad. One of the, you know, the um, C.S. Lewis, when he, he, he wrote a book um, in the 1940s called Mere Christianity. And in that book, many other writers have written about the same thing, actually. But in, uh, in that book, he talks about a natural moral law. One of the things he cites, he says that everybody knows that stealing something from the guy next door is a wrong thing to do. 
So, every, you know, if I was to steal your wallet or your nice tie, <laughs> that would be a wrong action. You know, it is wrong. Theft is wrong. Uh, everybody should understand that. But we've got to a situation in this country where, because of uh, liberal policies on law and order, the law is not respected in these matters. So people feel that in some way that stealing from a, from, from a big chain store is somehow not wrong. You know, that is, that is moral anarchy. And it's, it, it, it can only end in tears, that. You're working on your uh, interview series now for the New Humanum Project, where you, you talk with people about faith and its place in society. Why do you think it's important that you know, we talk about the divine? Because, um, because the divine is a reality. So the transcendent, that is what is beyond the material world, the here and now, the human reality. There is a something which transcends that animal, material reality in which we all exist. And I believe myself that that is, I choose to call that God. I think God exists. And I think that this, this idea that we have somehow, that we can do without this idea of God, that we can do without God, other societies have tried it. Uh, communist Russia tried it, Nazi Germany tried it, lots of other societies have tried it, and it ends always in human misery. Um, the, the, we don't talk about it in the society. There's an embarrassment about talking about religion and talking about religious faith, talking about God. Um, but what exactly have we put in its place? You know that old saw about when people stop believing in God, they'll believe in anything. That seems to me to have, <laughs> to have, to have proved itself true. That um, to take the idea, take one, one example, something in the current cultural discourse about the transgender, the transgender debate. You know, the Bible starts off, man, uh, male and female, he created them both. Right? He created them, and the old story about Eve, woman being created from uh, the rib of Adam, the spare rib. And um, so in the Bible, the, the, the notion of male and female is stated as a foundational, um, a foundation stone of creation, that that is how the world is made, male and female, in both humankind and in the animal kingdom. And along with our loss of belief in God, has become, has come along this mad idea that we can simply choose our own gender uh, because that's how we feel. That, that, is, um, that is a flight, that is a flight from reality. And it is, it is because we have rejected the wisdom of the old moral system that we feel we can now create whatever system we want. However, however fallacious, however ludicrous it is, it, 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 that, that if I came to you and professed a profound belief that I was Napoleon, um, I would hope that you wouldn't go along with my madness. You would say, well, actually, you're not Napoleon Robin, but, um, and I'd like you to come along and meet someone, a nice man who will try and help you in this matter and give you some pills or whatever, you know? <laughs> um, the idea that we should 
say to people who are transgender, yes, yes, you are. You know, you, you can be a woman, even if you're, even if you've got, even if you've got all the equipment that you were born with as as a male, you can be a woman. Mm -hmm. I think that's that is actually that's colluding in a madness. And um, the compassionate thing to do is to help those people come to a realization of who they really are. And uh, this question of sex, this question of male and female, is fundamental to, our, to, to the natural world. And it's not something you can just wish away because your feelings tell you you're in the wrong body. Um, so at the New Humanum, the interviews I do there, they're with people who, they're all people who've had a public life in one way or another. One who comes to mind was um, the ex-director general of the BBC, Mark Thompson. Um, these, are, these are people who have done big and important jobs. Some of them are politicians, some of them are journalists. Um, they've done big and important jobs, but they've kept a faith. And it has been a guiding light for them in their lives. And I think that, that um, I see myself as a very uh, fallible and uh, easily led, quite naive person in a way, I think probably I am. Therefore, I feel it's all the more important that I should have a firm set of principles which I can rely on to tell me what is right and what is wrong. And, um, you know, there's, 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 it is a great comfort to have a set of beliefs which, um, which uh, give you a moral highway code where you can judge whatever action it is you're about to undertake according to a strict set of precepts which will say, well, you know, do this, not that. Um, Hyperliberalism of the last 50 years has run entirely counter to that. So people have said, people like Dawkins, um, Professor Dawkins, has said that, mind you, even he says that the transgender thing is madness, so good for him. <laughs> so he's not, he's not entirely wrong. But, um, but you know, his, his, his idea that um, God is simply a myth that we can do without him, and we can construct a society according to enlightened views and beliefs is something which will end in tragedy. Wherever it's been tried, it has it ended in tragedy. And it's been, it has ended often in, in, in mass murder and, and death and destruction. Um, I fear for, you know, the reason why I, I'm always willing to talk about these matters as I'm talking to you is because I think that, that our culture is in danger. I don't think that the, the course we have been on over the past um, few decades, I think it's very wrong. And I think it has, it has led both the country, not just our country. I mean, this, you know, this is not, this is a global culture, really a global liberal culture. And, you know, when I, the, when you look at other cultures in the world, you know, the, so um, if you were a poor country and you were looking abroad at um, role models, what in our society exactly is it that they might find to admire? They might certainly admire our level of material comfort and prosperity, um, because, you know, despite what we tell ourselves, this is still a lucky country and and a rich country actually, and much better off and better looked after we are than in people in many other parts of the world. But when they look at the uh, the problems we have in our society, this thing I've been going on about, the, the unhappiness of people, the mental welfare of people, the family instability, the um, things that bedevil us like the pornography um, explosion, 
Why would they, why would it, they envy us those? They wouldn't. Here's a question. You know, often politics is discussed in terms of the prog progress, the progressives and the others. Yeah. Okay, what in this society today would progress look like? What would progress look like in Britain? Would it look like net zero? Well, I, mean, I have my own views on that. I, didn't think, I don't see it as a moral issue, but personally. But that's it. Real progress in the society would look at human flourishing, and it would look at the restoration of some norms which used to be held in the society, which I believe were good norms. Things about honesty, things about, um, things about uh, um, decency and immorality. I think that we would be a happier country if we attempted to return to some of the things which once were taken for granted in this country. So, from my point of view, progress would look like a return to some of the belief systems that we used to hold. That's what progress would look like. It, wouldn't, it does not look like a world in which everyone can choose their gender and uh, we can live without um, motor cars. You know, that, that to me does not look like progress. That looks like a fantasy, actually. Um, this, you know, this, this whole idea of progress in, in a political sense is very loaded and it's, so it's taken for granted that material progress, that uh, enriching society and enriching everyone within it is always, should always be the priority. Well, I think that that's debatable. I think that, that a fairer distribution would be, um, it is wrong that in our society, um, People are not paid a living wage, for instance. Um, so that's a, an aspect of society where progress would indeed look like a fairer distribution of the goods and services in the country. That's true. I would accept that. I don't accept that merely an ever-growing GDP is a sign of progress necessarily. It isn't. In fact, a lot of people already have too much. and these things which we gather to ourselves, these endless acquisitions of new kit, you know, they, the, the, um, the fleeting joy these things give you is soon gone just to be replaced by irritation, another, another piece of junk cluttering up the house. And in my case, one I can't use, probably. <laughs> uh, you know, so I, I'm very interested in the idea of progress. But, I, I'm, but I'm also very keen to explore how real progress in society might be achieved and what it would look like from a conservative point of view, if you like. Robin Aiken, thank you for joining us. Thank you very much indeed. It's been a pleasure.